Hello. This is working. Uh, hi, I'm David. I'm Jimmy. Together, David and Jimmy. And we're here to enlighten you on things that Google is doing with Debian OS on Google Compute Engine. Uh, basically, why we're here, uh, we're, oh, I should not stand in front of the slides. Uh, we're here because we're, we've started using Debian OS in our Google Compute Engine product, which is a virtual machine product in the cloud. Uh, we're here mostly because we want to build a good, solid relationship with the Debian community so that we can make that product smoother and more reliable and even more awesome than it is now. And in general, we want to share with you three things, what we've been doing before, what we're trying to do now, and what we'd like to be doing sometime in the future. Okay, so just in case none of you have paid much attention to what Google's been doing in the space, I felt I'd let you know what we are. Uh, we have a fairly large cloud platform by now. Uh, we have Google Compute Engine, which is a infrastructure as a service. We give you virtual machines in the cloud. We also have Google App Engine, which is a, it was a platform as a service. You give us some Java code written in a certain way, and we'll run it in the cloud. We also expose various storage subsystems at various levels. Uh, SQL, persistent disks, uh, NoSQL, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have various app level services such as BigQuery and, and various queue services and stuff like this. Uh, all these services are built on a, a common REST uh, interface so that you can write programmatically an interface with the cloud in a fairly consistent way. Uh, so what Compute Engine exactly is, it's infrastructure as a service. You sign, on, you sign up for our service and you tell us how many virtual machines you want, what they look like, how they're networked together, et cetera, et cetera and we give them to you and you give us some money. Uh, we've been around for about two years now. We launched the Google I.O. 2012, and this, Google, uh, this past Google I.O. in 2013, back in May, we made the product available to anybody who, wants, who has a credit card. Uh, the key idea here is that part of the thing that makes Google what it is, l lets Google make the products that it makes that kind of kick butt, uh, is the fact that our data centers are so impressively built and so well networked and so forth and so on. Uh, and, we, and the idea is that if other people are able to use that service, then they could also build some kickbutt services and make the world a better place. So Google Compute Engine, like I said, is virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, you have various ways of accessing the service. You can come in with a command line tool that we give you or build your own. You, there are programmatic APIs that you can use that all follow the REST uh, protocol. Uh, and we also have a little UI that you can use to, to launch VMs and manage them and so forth. Now, inside the data model basically looks sort of like you have some virtual machines and you, have, you can construct your own private, and, and private networks and connect them to the external internet. Each virtual machine has a disk of some sort. It can either be a persistent disk that continues or that exists when your VMs aren't running. It could be a scratch disk if you want some cheaper data storage. Or you can stick it in cloud storage, your data. Uh, these disks are built from what we call image templates, and the, these image templates are the key mechanism by which uh, operating system vendors, we intend to upload their operating systems to our cloud. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so, while, so I wanted to get you a little demo of what's going on in how to use it. There we go. I don't know how to use Jimmy's newfangled Linux computer. Uh, let's see. So I, this is our cloud console uh, for Google Compute. Is there a, there we go. So when you sign in, you get this little dashboard that tells you what's going on. You can see some utilization, network traffic, distant traffic of your entire fleet of, 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 of instances. You can launch a new instance by coming over here and clicking on new instance and entering some data. Hello, Debian. Let's see, let's scroll down, which I don't know how to do. And we'll choose a zone, we'll put this one in Europe. We'll give this one a Debian 7 image, which is, I guess, the default. Uh, let's see, and just, well, let's make a big one. Let's make a big 8 CPU one with 52 gigs of RAM and create. And it chugs and chugs and chugs and eventually gives you a virtual machine. Uh, 
wait for a moment for this to complete. Uh, how do I switch out? There's how I switch. So like I said, you can also come over to a command line tool called gcutil instances. And you can list the instances that are running inside of your system. And if we run this late enough, we will see the output of the instance that we've just created. There we go. Hello, Debian, sitting there in the Europe zone. We've got zones scattered across the, the globe. You can choose the one you want. And ah, how do I get out? It doesn't actually matter. Alt tab. Tab? There we go. OK. Ah, should we SSH in? Yeah, let's SSH in. So we can SSH in. I should have picked a smaller name. Oh. Ah, what about the password? Is sometimes okay. So we use uh, SSH keys to allow you to talk to uh, talk to your VM to SSH into your VMs. Uh, we have a, a, a small management infrastructure that injects some user accounts into your virtual machines and provisions the SSH keys that you need to connect. You have to control C and start that again. And we should be in. Maybe. Oh, no. Wrong key? No, no, it's just, uh, ah. So you only have to, um, you know, generate a key once per uh, per machine you're connecting from. It, it, it it's a private key and it uh, um, uh, it generates a local key pair on your workstation and it uh, uses some cloud stuff and a cron job in the instance to uh, install it. We need music for this. Yeah. Okay, so again, you see that you've got a nice little Debian operating system here. You can run things. You can sudo and apt-get, I don't know, less. Let's apt-get some less. No, I want to do apt-get moo, right? Sure. Aptitude moo. Aptitude, Aptitude, that's totally proof <laughs> that it's running Debian. Is that right? There we go. <laughs> and then if you're really questioning, there you go. No, no, cr nobody in their right mind would ever fake this interface. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and I switch back, alt tab. There we go. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so again, why are we here? We want to basically get work with you guys to. To make this, make the Debian OS, like the Debian OS on Google <coughs> Compute Engine products, really sing and really integrate nicely for customers, and we also want to make sure that all of the software that we produce for our cloud and for Google Compute in specific, but throughout our whole cloud, basically make it nicely available with Debian packages, et cetera, et cetera, so that it's easy to use for anybody running Debian inside our cloud or outside our cloud. Plus, I want some swag. Okay, so the outline of this talk. Ah, uh, we're not presenting. So the outline of this talk, we have uh, just a few things to talk about. Uh, first, we want to talk to you about how we're actually going building our Debian <coughs> operating system images and pushing them into Google Compute Engine. And then we're going to move on and start talking about the package repository mirrors, mirroring system that we have in place that mirrors Debian packages into our cloud for various reasons. Uh, and we're going to give you some previews for the tutorial that's coming that Mandy over here, Mandy, is going to be giving later today, just a short while from now, about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, and we're going to be giving you previews for the BOFs that, that Jimmy and I are going to be giving today and tomorrow too. Okay. So at that, I'm going to give Jimmy uh, give the mic over to Jimmy. Hi. So. Um we are using a tool uh, to build the Debian images, which actually came from the Debian community. We did not create this tool. The tool at one point supported only Amazon EC2, and um, we contributed support under the same license, you know, patch sent back to the community um, to add support for Google Compute Engine, and accordingly, the name was broadened to build Debian Cloud. 
we worked with Andrew Dingerman, he was very helpful and we tested with both the Debian Cloud mailing list and one-on-one -on -one interactions. And images based on this tool shipped in May, very soon after we <coughs> before Google I.O., there was a blog post uh, and a, a mention in the Google Compute Engine sessions at I.O. We have images for both Squeeze and Wheezy uh, and intend to proceed to Jesse when the time comes. So as you can see, the tool has subcommands for both clouds that it supports. And Andrews is good about merging our patches. We are submitting them pretty often as well. Um, he is working on a Python rewrite support still needs to be added for our cloud, but uh, that will happen. Uh, Build Debian Cloud is Apache license. Our contributions preserve that. It's all free software. So how does it work? So the parts in green are specific to Google Compute Engine within the context of this tool. EC2 has different ways of doing it. The black row about the bootstrap is shared. So it's like a lot of other disk image builds for um, OpenStack or VMware or what have you, or you know, KVM. Uh, we have a local disk file. We, loop, we put a partition table. We put a file system. We loop back mount it the bootstrap, install stuff. It's a very simple tarball in the end with a disk .wall file in it that represents the image. It's, we use sparse compression and sparse, um, we, 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 we are space efficient using sparse uh, technologies of that <coughs> sort. Uh, and we upload it to Google Cloud Storage, which we didn't say what that is. It's a um, object uh, value store like a lot of the other ones like S3 and so forth. It's uh, um, we can, and so once the image is uploaded there, uh, we can just use GPU tilt to add it, and a command similar to that is used. We would probably add it to a testing project, um, but, uh, and, and then when we're ready to publish it, it would basically be this. We can give a description as well. Um, <coughs> so what we've been doing, and what we want to keep doing, with uh, Debian's involvement ideally, is we want to periodically, every time there's a new Debian stable minor or major release, or whenever there's enough new Google updates to provide, or whenever it makes sense, uh, for bug fixes, vulnerabilities, whatever, to produce new images, and test them somewhere. There's not, a, I'm gonna talk more about this in one of our, our buffs, but there's no great way for Debian to quality assure or test a Debian cloud image, but. I do a quick manual test, and Google has some internal tests that we run. It's not comprehensive, but it's useful. Uh, and then we publish it in the Debian Cloud project, which is set up so that every customer of Google Compute Engine can see those images. And our tools and web interfaces have some support for the Debian Cloud project and, and another one for a different OS. Uh, and and that's the entire project. That's the entire process for us for publishing. So the releases right now are built by me wearing both my Googler and Debian developer hats. It would be great if non-Googler Debian developers were to get involved. We designed the process so, so that any Debian developer or really anybody who Debian trusts can do this. They just have to have a Google account of some sort and they can, they can be granted permission to publish to this project. Um, so we wanna coordinate with Debian on this and validate things to make sure that it meets everyone's quality needs, certainly Debian's and Google's. Uh, but it should be a collaboration and that will be great. So the name on the slide is slightly wrong. It's Debian Cloud's Experiments, plural, uh, which is a free project which is with a small shared quota. We're covering the cost of this, of both of these. Uh, that project is, let's say you want to validate an image or try out building the image or some Debian related short term or small scale test that would be, or development. Yeah, uh, we actually gave some uh, access to this, to Neuro Debian just to give a, a broader scope Debian related example. Um, and for the official image releases of the Debian Cloud project. And you can email us at our work addresses, cash and jkaplowitz at google.com for access. Um, okay, so for package repository mirrors, it's always possible to send uh, 
our customers through the global Debian mirror network. At the same time, if they you keep their bandwidth within our network, they can save both bandwidth for them and for Google and money as well for them. Uh, so we do have a local mirror that we're running inside the cloud and our images default to that, plus the global mirror redirector. Sure, uh, yeah. So we want the images to be fast and to not overload the public servers and as I said, to save money. So our mirror is synced using FTP sync like good practices suggest. Um, we, we actually serve it via Google Cloud Storage which can be accessed directly over HTTP. Uh, this has some geo-balancing properties. It has some uh, reliability, scalability. It's uh, <coughs> replicated, et cetera. Um, it's a good infrastructure and if there's, you know, since we sort of jury rig this system to combine FTP sync and Google Cloud Store, so if uh, we, we have F F HTTP net in there so that there's, Apt has very good built-in redundancy. We've tested this, it actually does fall over nicely. So, um, so people will be sure to get current packages. So some things we would like to evolve this toward it would be great to talk to the FTP team and the mirror admin team about being a tier one push mirror simply because there's a lot of users in the Google Cloud and Debian is a very common choice now for their operating system and it would be great to get updates. We may also want to see about getting our mirror added to Raphael's great redirector service, HTTP Debian Net, uh, for customers visiting from Compute Engine. And I know Amazon is also using CloudFront to serve a mirror in their cloud. We're trying Google Cloud Storage. It's a similar concept. It would be great to have an interoperable way, not specific to one cloud, to do a direct push to CDNs. This would be more of a development, you know, speculative thing, but there are several different clouds where pushing to an object value store in some way might skip an intermediate step and add stream, streamline that process. So uh, at this point, we have a brief preview of the two buffs. So I should mention again, it's not a buff per se, but at 11.30, there's one talk in between this one and Mandy's talk. Mandy's talk is a tutorial, an interactive tutorial. You can participate with or without a Google account. You can just use your laptop um, or, or watch her as she does it at 11.30 right here. Um, She'll give you a quick whirlwind spin through it all. And uh, at 15.30, 3.30 p.m. in this room today, I'll be doing a more Debian focused buff, but with examples from Google uh, about the question of what Debian should consider an official Debian image in the cloud. It's a bit different than the CD context we have historically done, but with some attention to the needs of public clouds and figuring out how to satisfy the needs of Debian cloud vendors and Debian for its customers in the cloud and uh, how to move that forward. Tomorrow uh, at 9.30 as well in the morning in the second talk room, not here, uh, David will be leading a, a buff which is also general to Debian but he's again bringing examples from our experience about packaging cloud specific software, it often has recent dependencies or fast changing environments and features. There's, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of unique quirks to the cloud context and the vendor relationship context that are certainly not specific to Google Compute Engine and we hope that both of these buffs, other cloud providers will participate, uh, but they should be good ways to move the issues forward. So a quick preview of my buff. Uh, this afternoon is basically what I said. There's a question of what official even means in the context of a cloud VM. You know, sometimes you need to tweak the configuration to you know, to um, to work smoothly. Sometimes you have a bug or vulnerability, even specific to the environment. We've seen performance issues and other other weird situations. Debian, of course, has its its values about licensing, and it needs control over security and packaging to be reasonable to call Debian, it needs to be supportable. Um, 
but integration is a tough question as well. Cloud init is one thing that might streamline the process, but there's a lot of other questions that are outside the scope of cloud init. So we can discuss this more this afternoon right here. So here's David to finish the slides a bit and talk about his thoughts. Thanks. Uh, so I want to talk again, I want to go back in history a little bit. To, I want to go back in history a little bit. Like I said earlier, Google Compute's been around a couple of years now. When we first got into the business of building images for the cloud, we didn't know what to do. And so in general, what we did was we created a, a local disk file, we mounted it locally, and just started de-bootstrapping and changing crazy files inside. Just whenever we needed a package, we copied it in. Whenever we needed some sort of tool, we, so we modded it, in, or we took, drew it into it, and, and installed the, some random piece of software outside of the Debian packaging system or the RPM packaging system, which we were, in, in whatever context we were installing software. And in general, we found that that was a generally a bad problem, or a bad way of doing things, right? Because there are several downsides, which you probably all know, which is that you can't upgrade and remove packages very easily. You can't fix bugs with an app get update or an app get upgrade, right? So in general, we've, we've been finding that, and I think in general that the Debian operating system community would rather not have us just putting random files inside the operating system, right? Um, so in general, what we're trying to do now is, is take all the software that we're trying to stick into the images and convert them to Debian packages and make sure that they're all just a simple app get install of a, of a Google package. Uh, and, and one of the things that we'd like to have in particular is we'd like to figure out a way of getting these packages where appropriate <coughs> into the official Debian release stream and into backports whenever that's appropriate or if there's some other mechanism we need, we should figure out what that looks like. I want to give you a general overview of the kinds of software that we stick inside the images. Uh, we put only, in general, we only put on, uh, completely 100% free software Apache licensed stuff. In general, that's Google's way. Uh, the key components here are some startup scripts to get the system bootstrapped in the, in the virtualization environment. It figures out what the instance name is, the host name, things like this. We've got a management daemon that manages accounts and networking. Uh, so whenever the network changes on the, on, the oper on the VM, the operating system that can then be notified and said, oh, by the way, you've got like load balancing features now, or you've got this, or you've got that, or your IP address has changed, et cetera. Uh, we install some simple tools to talk to the Google Cloud <laughs> systems. We've got a, a compute tool and a storage tool, and there will be more coming down the line as we finish the integration with the rest of the Google Cloud properties. We've got some image snapshotting tools to basically let you take the current contents of your disk and create an, another temp, a, an, a disk temp, an image template from it so that you can create multiple VMs from the current, from, from, so basically you can take the current VM and clone it more or less. Uh, we also sometimes try to install some security lockdowns. So for instance, sometimes we want to go in and modify SSH configs. Our security teams are very, eager to have us say turn off root login and things like this. And so far as I know, there's no great way of just installing the Google security lockdown package and having it go in and modify all the files of SSH and this and that and the other packages that are installed in the system. Uh, so some of these things are easier to do than some of the others. It's easy to say, I think, just make them all Debian packages and move on with life. I don't know, how many of you have had trouble building a Debian package before. Oh, ah, sweet. <laughs> Thank God, I'm in light company. Okay, we're still a minority. We should get together, the three of us, later and commiserate. I'll buy you all a beer. Uh, anyway, so moving on. So I want to give you a couple of examples of the things that we've been doing, uh, some of the packages that we built, and some of the things that made them hard. Uh, GCUtil is what we call our is the what we call our command line tool for the Google Compute product. It's a pure Python program. It's got several dependencies, and again, it's 100% open source Apache license. You would think it'd be simple to just install as a Debian package. Uh, we used to be using it's a Pi but part of the problem here is that it's a Python package. We used to be using setup tools and PyPy to do all of our dependency management, but we found that in general the Python module system was 
picking up system modules and stuff like this sometimes, and sometimes our modules, and it was just causing us trouble validating and m maintaining quality control really over the product. People will come in with bug reports like this isn't working and it turns out because they've installed some crazy version of some crazy dependency we had and it's like, oh. Anyway, so eventually we decided to ditch the PyPy system. We copied all, a copy, we basically picked a particular version of each of our dependencies and we basically copied them into our package statically and we forced the Python interpreter to load all the modules from that directory rather than from the system. Uh, and that makes the, the, the control of the quality of the, of the products uh, a lot easier to validate, right? Because we test exactly what the customer is running. Uh, and we just inserted a make file into our, into our source code, our tar file, and we run dhmake and build, dpackage, build package, and all that stuff to make our Debian. Uh, good. Um, GSU, so that one was somewhat easy because we only had to do the, the version management, the, the, the static linking of the Python code, if you want to call it that. Uh, GSUtil is our storage tool. It's a little bit harder. We haven't figured out exactly what we want to do with that yet. And hopefully one of you will tell us, two of you, maybe multiple, many of you might tell us exactly what we need to do. Uh, again, it seems like it should be simple. It's 100% open source software. It's the tool itself is all written in Python. It takes many Python dependencies and it takes a few p binary Python dependencies. The problem is that both of all the dependencies we take, the versions that we want to be using are not available in either Squeeze or Wheezy. And so getting a Debian for GSUtil that installs in Squeeze or Wheezy is challenging. Either we have to go and build new versions of say CRC mod and things like this and publish those somewhere, I guess, I don't know. We don't know the process that needs to happen here. Uh, and again, because this tool is, uses PyPy and, and setup tools, sometimes we run into these version conflicts where the system, where Python loads a module from one place instead of another place and gets a different version. And we <coughs> sometimes have to just plaster over those errors, <laughs> right, whenever the Python interpreter says, oops, there's a version mismatch. And we'd like to have a better solution here too. Uh, and if you guys have any recommendations, I really encourage you to come tomorrow at 9.30 uh, to the, the packaging talk and tell us what to do because we need our we need you guys to help us. <laughs> That's in the second talk room, not yes. here. Very good point. Very good point. It's that way, I think, right? Below the bar. Below the bar. Afterwards, we can go for drinks and commiserate. Okay, man. All I want to do is buy people beer. Okay. <laughs> if you help me fix my problems, I will buy you beer. That's my promise to you. Um, good. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to say? Questions. Are there questions? No questions. Oh, there's somebody, there's somebody moving around. What's that? I don't have any No one has questions. This one works too now, so we have two microphones. There we go. So, in terms of uh, API, what you provide is completely different from what uh, AWS and uh, Eucalyptus provide. In terms of uh, API, REST API and stuff like that, what you, what you use is completely different from what uh, uh, Amazon Web, Web Services and uh, Eucalyptus provide. Uh, it, it's different from other services? Is that what you're asking? asking about yes. The yes, it's a com it's, we invented a completely new API. We thought that the existing examples of APIs weren't to our liking. They didn't uh, provide the same sort of structure that we would like to see. So ours is a fairly hierarchical structure of, the object model is basically mirrored in the API, if that makes sense. I think most other providers have a flat sort of key value kind of configuration process for VMs and other things. We wanted to sort of break it out a little bit and we think that, that in, future, in the future, it's gonna make it easier to integrate with other kinds of products. So for instance, this is sort of happening now. If you look at the Google Compute product as it stands now, the, we started with virtual machines and now, and basic networking, and now we're inventing all sorts of new subtrees in the API for uh, load balancing and advanced networking and routing and different kinds of disks and so forth and so on. And so instead of just pushing them all into one namespace, we have a little bit more structure.
a couple of uh, related comments. The uh, authentication is handled differently in the normal case than with, uh, than with say, S3 or Eucalyptus because it doesn't actually rely on a shared secret. It uses OAuth 2, and so there's scoped and time-limited tokens with refresh ability, and in various ways, that's a good security advantage. Uh, they can also be revoked. Uh, and we do, for the cloud storage product, the object value store, have an interoperable uh, way that is similar to S3 and Eucalyptus that you can use it. It's not as full-featured as the native API. And, and one more point, I think just last week, I think we pushed uh, Google Compute compatibility into libcloud. And so I think in the future, you'll find that most of the middleware is going to understand pretty easily how to adapt between both Google Compute and other products. And, but if you want to take full advantage of all the Google Compute features and that nested hierarchy thing, then you come directly to us. Or if you're building other things for other Google properties, right, they all have a fairly similar structure, if that makes sense, right? And so if I go from Google, if I'm programming for Google Compute and Google Storage and Google Prediction and Google Docs, the APIs are all sort of similar. And uh, there's other middleware that support for our stuff has been added to, such as in Ruby, Fog, I believe, now supports Compute Engine. And uh, I believe Voto, uh, has support for Google Cloud Storage. Other questions? Um, one simple they're, they're suggestion. Up. Uh, you mentioned uh, different uh, package libraries for the packaging. So why don't you just use a Debian mechanism that already exists and it's called app binning. So why don't you use that to specify which versions of the packages you want to use? If you need I don't know. Maybe you should talk to me more about that. I <laughs> barely know anything about app pinning. Well, I mean, I know something about it, but I don't know if, like, my understand. Well, I don't know. So my understanding is that pinning basically, I don't know. Maybe Jimmy can correct me. It is a bit error prone, especially as you mix different versions of things. We, you know, we, we could consider it if the packages are intended, for example, to be used with a stable release only. Uh, and then we would have a single target to make a repository for but it would be better to do things in a way where we didn't have to worry about what the pins are. Right, but you don't have to like do the whole repository. Maybe you can only specify that particular version, na name of the package you want to use. Now the, the that way now the pinning forces the version of the package on the operating system so entirely, or? So basically you could use stable system, but you need uh, newer uh, versions of the package so you could pull that particular version from unstable, for example, yes. without breaking your uh, stable system. But if you're doing the whole repository, then you could maybe break it, but if you specify that particular version, then it's completely safe. But I do that all the time, user, and it's... But does each user have to, like, do the pinning operation themselves, or does the package no, itself No, 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 whoever sets up the repositories does that, it's, so it's... It's a little bit more error prone than you're making it out to, but come to the box tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah. all right. How should I see Google Computing Engine? Can I compare it to a virtual private server, VPS? How does a Google Compute Engine compare to a virtual private server? It's fairly similar. Uh, the, you have various options when, you're talk when you get into the Google Compute land. You can connect the virtual machine to Google infrastructure in a little bit more simple way. In, with more proximity, right? So you can be close to all the Google services that you might want to use. Uh, other things that might be different, you can configure the networking so that you have internet egress or ingress, or you can have a private network, things like this. And it's all just fairly, it's all API driven, so you can configure this, the, 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 the infrastructure as you want, as you wish. And I think virtual VPS systems don't always give you that functionality. Uh, certainly not the proximity but otherwise fairly similar. So they also have, um, the, the, the storage is, the, the, stor the persistent storage, for example, is a lot more reliable than a typical hard disk. It's, uh, you know, the whole, the whole Google Compute stack, you know, below the 
virtual machine level, you know, the under the underlying stack is built on top of stuff that Google depends on for its business, and and so there's there's a lot more, you know, a lot more focus on low level and systems infrastructure performance and durability and similar things. Uh, for example, there's a lot of great stuff happening to improve network performance, et cetera. So there's a lot of advantages to leveraging what Google is trying to do in those regards. Uh, there's one other difference is that in general, the market that Google's currently looking at and focusing on is the people who care about having a dedicated server, a dedicated hardware, right? So if you really need like a single CPU to be there all the time and or eight CPUs to be there all the time, you get full eight CPUs and full RAM and this, that, and the other and full networking, this is sort of the market that we're targeting at the moment. We've started doing fractional machines so that you can get timeshares and get a cheaper version of the, of the hardware if you don't need it on all the time. But in general, we've been focusing on people who need a lot of power and a lot of reliability. So it would be a good option for me to use it as a compile engine. Yes, that's, okay. the, that's the, the, the really awesome use case right now. Uh, we're building out facilities to give you more features and functionality, right? If you need a web ser like if you need web services and, or work queues, things like that. No, but looking for us, okay, now I have them for the development. Now I uh, gonna start a, a compile cycle. Then I need compute uh, power, and when I'm done, I'm going to sleep. Uh, I want to switch it off, and at that moment, uh, should the cost counter stop? Yes. Yeah, you would, uh, if the machine is not running, you would only be paying for any stores that you're continuing to use, but you wouldn't be paying for the compute resources or any stores that is not persistent. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right, we only got a few minutes left. Uh, maybe one more question. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you to Google. And, thank you, guys. Uh, appreciate the information.